Okay, let's go to our preaching time. I'm going to go back about five years and preach a sermon that I haven't, I don't believe I've preached since that time. I always enjoyed preaching and I liked it, but I don't know if everybody else liked it. You're going to hear it anyway, so you might as well get ready. I want you to open your Bibles, please, to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 15. Jeremiah, chapter 15. Jeremiah 15, and I'm going to call your attention to two verses there, verses 15 and 16. Jeremiah 15, verses 15 and 16. It says there, O Lord, thou knowest, remember me and visit me and revenge me of my, excuse me, of my persecutors. Take me not away in thy long suffering. Know that for thy sake I have suffered rebuke. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. In this text, Jeremiah says, verse 16, that when he found the words of God, he ate them. He didn't actually chew on the parchment or the scroll, put paper in his mouth. It's a figure of speech. Uh, in the book of Revelation, Revelation 10, verses 9 and 10, the Apostle John is commanded to eat a little book, which he does. However, when he did, he was in the middle of a heavenly vision, so he didn't actually chew on a book either. It's a metaphor. It's a figure of speech. Uh, when Jeremiah ate the words of God, it simply means that he dwelt on them. He uh, paid attention to them. He took them in and considered what God wanted to say to him. Job 34, verse 3 states, For the ear trieth words as the mouth tasteth meat. As like I say, it's a, a metaphor. It's a, a figure of speech. You've heard the expression, something is food for thought. Well, that's, what, that's how the Bible is using these expressions. You tell off somebody and you say, chew on that for a while, pal. That's what he means. Jeremiah also says, Then when he ate the words of God, quote, It was the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. Why would that be? He said, Because, For I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. You know, for a real Christian who professes to know God, who professes to know Jesus Christ, the word of God should be his most prized possession. It should be the most valuable thing that he has, and to have access to the, the uh, uh, words of God, he can read on the page of his own Bible and discern in his, in his own mind. That should be a very valuable thing. It really should. I love the Bible. You know, the Bible is God's love letter to a fallen, wicked, sinful world that's corrupted with um, uh, wickedness and uh, evil at morning, noon, and night. It's got the curse of sin all over it. Like Jeremiah, we should dwell on God's words, ponder over them, me uh, meditate upon them, consider what God might want to say to us when we read them. Um, like, like you would uh, uh, a good meal. You go to a, a, a nice restaurant, you enjoy a good meal, you savor every bite, and you're, you're, you're sorry when the meal is over because you've been enjoying every single thing about it. That's how I am with uh, Vince's spaghetti. My mom and dad raised us at Vince's, and my wife's family raised her at Vince's, and uh, we spent half of our dating life uh, going to Vince's when we were, <laughs> we were going out with each other. <laughs> and uh, I, love, I love their sauce. Some people don't like it, but that's their problem. And they don't know what's good. But anyway, so I want to preach a sermon I call, Why Men Don't Feed on the Word of God. Why they don't feed on the Word of God. If it's that important, then it should be important to the man or to the woman. Point number one, they don't feed on the Word of God because they're not hungry for it. They're simply not hungry for it. David wrote Psalm 119, verse 103, How sweet are thy words unto my mouth, yea, sweeter than honey to my 
to my excuse me, to my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Excuse me. It's too bad that uh, many Christians aren't hungry for the Bible. They don't crave it like a good meal. They're not, they're not hungry for it the way they ought to be. They're hungry for other things, but they're not hungry for the Word of God. And um, people can form a craving for all kinds of things. Alcohol, tobacco, drugs. Things that aren't any good for them. Things that aren't good when they first start, right? They never get any better. But they're not quitters, right? They, get, they hang in there. They stick with it. They don't want to give up. And um, the first time you taste those things, they're terrible. But like I say, you're not ready to quit. You're not ready to give up just yet. And when you do try to quit, you think you're going to die if you can't have it. This is how people get addicted to things that they shouldn't be uh, addicted to. Interested in things they shouldn't be interested in. Uh, spiritually speaking, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ should have that kind of a, a hunger, that kind of a desire to receive something from the Bible. We call it the Holy Bible because it's the Word of God. It's not simply the words of men. God gave ten commandments, not ten suggestions. Right. We consider these words to be the divine words of a divine God. And this is what God wants us to read. These are the words He wants us to know, to see, to discern. This is the vocabulary He wants us to memorize. These are the words God wants us to know. And as Bible believers here, Bible Baptist Church International, we don't believe in changing the Bible. The Bible's job is to change us. Anybody that doesn't approach the Bible that way is not a Bible believer. He's playing games, doing some other thing, but he's not a Bible believer. Like coming in from the heat of the day, uh, you're exhausted, you've been, just been running a marathon, you're, you're thirsty as can be, you're desperate for something to drink. Everyone, a Christian should have that desire to read the Bible. You don't find Christians that way anymore these days. Do you know something? This is a free country, and you can believe any version of the Bible you want to believe. I have yet to meet an NIV Bible believer. I have yet to meet a New American Standard Bible believer. I have yet to meet a New Living Translation Bible believer. I have yet to meet a Living Bible uh, uh, believer. You're free to use any version you want, but believe it for goodness sake. And hunger for it and, des and desire it and say, this is the, the standard by which I'm going to measure my life and uh, live up to Jesus' uh, expectations of me. But uh, Job says, I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Job 23, verse 12. Even though he had to eat every day, he said to receive something from the word of God was even more important than that. Yet yeah, if they passed a law making it illegal to own a copy of the Bible or to read a copy of the Bible, suddenly Christians would start wanting to read the Bible. They'd try to scramble, see if, if they can remember, remember any verses they, were, they learned in Sunday school. See how many verses I once memorized once upon a time, see if I can still recall them. They neglect it, put it off to the side, see it's not important, doesn't matter to me. But suddenly if it was denied them, they'd suddenly find a hunger for it they didn't have before. Secondly, men don't feed on the Word of God because they're full from something else. They're full from something else. You know, you can't eat candy and sweets and junk food right before dinner time, or you won't be hungry when the real food shows up. And every kid has tried to do that. And uh, people feed their souls on all sorts of things. Internet, television, texting all day long, uh, stupid YouTube videos, they're sending back and forth to each other, different memes and so forth, uh, Facebook, everything else, every other distraction, every other uh, uh, idiotic diversion that keeps their attention off of things of God. You know, it's amazing how uh, much time people have spent obsessing with things like Bigfoot, And uh, really, really, UFOs, UFOs, and whether we landed on the moon, and all of these things. Now, some of those arguments may have a little bit of curiosity, uh, curious merit to them, and they, they might pose a question that needs to be answered from time to time. 
But in the big picture of things, they're not important. And yet it's amazing how much time people waste worrying about that instead of worrying about what God wants them to know and God expects them to know as believers. And uh, they'll polish off the morning newspaper and then uh, think that, uh, but they don't have time for the Bible. They don't have time for any sort of spiritual devotions. They have this little thing called Our Daily Bread. It's a little half-page devotional booklet, little uh, inspirational message and a couple of verses of the scripture. And people think that they fed on the word of God once they've read that. Listen, if that's the sum uh, total of your spiritual diet, you're going to starve as a Christian. That might be a vitamin supplement, but that's as far as you can, that's all you can say about it. You can't make a meal on the little things the Lady at Hickory Farms gives you on the toothpick, right? I know, I've tried. i tell you what I did when the kids were early teenagers. We went to the mall, and uh, we went to the food court. You know, there's always someone with a, uh, a piece of beef on a toothpick or a teriyaki chicken on a toothpick. You know, you walk by, get your samples there. Go to Hickory Farms, get a sample of cheese there. Go to Seize Candy, get a free piece of candy over there. And then we drove across the street to Costco, <laughs> and the lady's giving the samples out there. Yeah, I'm a, chi I'm a tightwad. I was cheap. I was having a lot of fun, but uh, I think the kids were embarrassed. <laughs> but you can't make a meal on those little things. And uh, people don't feed their souls on what's really important. They feed their souls on all kinds of garbage and time-wasting and sports and politics, and any number of other subjects that really don't uh, matter in the big picture of eternity. And yet they think those are all important. Their attention has been exhausted with other subjects, and they're not interested in the Bible any longer. They've spoiled themselves. And um, like I say, you can't make a meal on a little half-page devotional booklet once a day, and usually uh, most Christians don't remember to do that every day. They might remember it two or three times a week. And so even then, they're not getting much. If you read the Bible um, and read three chapters of the Bible every day, five chapters on Sunday, you can complete the entire Bible in exactly one year. If you read seven chapters of the Bible every day, seven days a week, you can complete the entire Bible twice in a year and have an extra 25 days unused left over. If you read 10 chapters of the Bible seven days a week, you can read through your Bible three times in a year with eight unused days remaining. If you do it systematically, you can accomplish a lot of things. But you have to have a game plan. You have some, some strategy. You have to say, God, help me to do this. Help me to be disciplined. You know, the, the root of the word uh, disciple is discipline. Why people aren't disciplined is a great mystery indeed. The Bible is a complete diet if people would give it a chance. It really is. The words of God are called the sincere milk of the word. 1 Peter 2, verse 2. Well, from milk, you get vitamin D, calcium, Carbohydrates. It's called the bread of life, Luke chapter 11. Well, from that you get protein, starches, vitamin B. It's called apples of gold in pictures of silver, Proverbs 25. Well, from apples you get uh, vitamins A, vitamin C, potassium, sugars. It's said to be honey to the taste, Psalm 119. There you get sugars mineral salts. We read the washing of water by the word, Ephesians chapter 5. Well, water is, a necess is necessary for every function of the body. It's said to be strong meat of the word, Hebrews chapter 5. From meat you get vitamin B complex, amino acids, iron, phosphate, zinc. The Bible is a complete diet, spiritually speaking, if for the person that, that gives it a chance. It gives God a chance. It's also uh, perfect for the believer. It's also complete equipment. Let me elaborate on that. God's words are likened to fire. 
Jeremiah 23, and a hammer, and like unto nails, Ecclesiastes 12. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6. A lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, Psalm 119. You know, if you have fire and nails and a hammer and a sword and a lamp, and you're not lazy, and fire, you should be able to survive in any jungle, any hostile climate in the world. But people don't give the Bible a chance because uh, they're full from other things. Other things have their attention. Other things have distracted them. Other things are more important to them than being true to the Word of God. Thirdly, let me say this. Some people don't feed on the Word of God because of sickness. Because of sickness. When you don't feel good, you don't have much appetite, you don't want to eat anything. Actually, the thought of eating might make you feel even worse. And I think everyone's probably gone through that at one time or another. And when the soul is sick because of sin, the last thing in the world you're interested in is what God says about it. You really are. The adulterer doesn't want to read, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Exodus 20. Some alcoholic, some drunk, doesn't want to read, wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Proverbs 20. The agnostic, he can't stomach the words, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Psalm 14. The liar, he's too weak to read words such as, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Sin makes the heart sick. Sin makes the body sick. And the world says, you know, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. There used to be a Christian expression that said, this book will keep me from sin, or sin will keep me from this book. And Christian would draw a line in the sand. I'm not going to let anything get in the way of me reading the Word of God meditating on the Word of God, memorizing Scripture from the Word of God, and asking God to speak to my heart and my mind and my thought and my soul and my conscience by what I read in the Word of God. Not anymore. Christians are pathetic when it comes to the Word of God. God's book offers hope, but more Christians would, be, would rather live hopeless without any direction, without any moral compass at all. Only well, direction to spirituality at all. Some men don't feed on the Word of God because they're sick from the things of this life, the, the, the sick from the things of sin. And the problem is, a lot of Christians want to remain sick. They don't want to get well. They'd rather stay sick, they'd rather stay in their weakened condition and say, well, I'm enjoying what I'm doing day after day, and no one's pressuring me to go to church, or to sing the Christian song, or to learn the Word of God, or to be with other Christians. Uh, this, this jumped out at me a couple weeks back. The Bible says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ, uh, Galatians 6, 2. You can't do that unless you go to be with other Christians. Unless you're with other Christians, you can't do that, and they can't depend upon you, you can't depend upon them. You can't bear one another's burdens if you say, well, I don't need to talk to them. They've got nothing to offer to me. You need to be with other Christians, and you need to be where the Word of God is going to be taught and uh, uh, conveyed to you and burned into your heart and your conscience with some measure of conviction and convincing uh, to tell you that this is what you need. I don't care what you don't, you don't like it or not. This is what you need. Fourthly, let me say this. Some men don't feed on the Word of God because it's too hard to chew. It's too hard to chew. Years ago, they used to have this... I'll use this illustration because it's, it's a perfect illustration. They used to have this $3.99 steak and egg breakfast special over here at Michael J's on Vineyard Avenue. The eggs were fine. Hash browns were fine. But eh, nine times out of ten, if I ordered it, I knew why it was $3.99. That piece of meat was like a, a piece of uh, a catcher's mitt, the baseball glove. It was tough. It was hard to chew. I don't, you couldn't put enough ketchup or, or steak sauce on it to, to get it to go down. It was, I mean, <laughs> snap. It was awful. It was awful. And some 
People don't want to read the Bible. They don't want to spend time in the Bible. They don't want to memorize Scripture. They don't want to discern and compare Scripture to Scripture and learn something from the Bible because they think it's too hard uh, to digest. It's too difficult to chew. And it's true that certain parts of the Bible are more difficult to wade through than others. I mean, who enjoys reading about the genealogies? Who enjoys reading about all the knops and the flowers and the sockets and all those things that went in the tabernacle? Who enjoys reading about the, the Aaron's um, garments and uh, every measurement that went into the, the outer court and the inner court of the tabernacle and the temple? And those things are very difficult to wade through. They really are. But you know something? Just about every technical manual, just about every textbook has some difficult parts in it. it you know, uh, it, enjoy the, the, uh, the, the, the nut and spit out the kernel if you have to, but how many have ever taken a handful of pomegranate seeds, chewed the whole handful up in your mouth at one time, and then you just spit out the pulp, just because you want to get the juice and then you spit the pulp out? You might have to approach the Word of God that way. Take what you can and pray that God helps you learn a little by little by little. Some people are better students and quicker uh, uh, students than other uh, people are. That's true with just about every subject. But don't say, I'm not going to do it because uh, it's difficult for me. It's confusing. Um, I get disoriented. I'm not sure exactly what I'm reading about. And, and, uh, you know, the Apostle Paul told the Corinthians that this was the, their case. He said, I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it. They couldn't handle anything strong. They couldn't handle any sound doctrine. A lot of Christians are that way. They can't handle any sound doctrine. You know, doctrine is really a very simple proposition. It's the entire Bible's teaching on any given subject. Take a verse over here, match it with another verse on the same subject over there. A third verse over here that says essentially the same thing. Put all three of those things together and you start build the, the, the summary, the substance of a Bible doctrine. Take shape that way. Any Christian can learn the Word of God that way. But some people are afraid. You know something? God gave you uh, filet mignon in the Word of God. Don't sit there and ask Him to cut it up for you, too. Put a little effort into it. There's something to be uh, learned. There's something to be appreciated by you putting forth a little effort to uh, ask God to help you discern what, what it means, what's right, what's wrong. How do I fully understand that? that uh, verse, it'll be a great blessing to you. You should at least uh, eat the kernel and spit out the shell. You know, if God thought that certain things were important enough to put in His Bible and to keep them in His Bible for the last 3,000 years, then who are you or I to say, I don't want that? Who are you and I to say, well, that's not important? About 35 years ago, they came up with the Reader's Digest Bible. They took anything they thought was repetitive or, or uh, redundant, and they erased it, eliminated it, and uh, shrunk it down so that it would simply be the very, very direct uh, reference to a story so that you could read it without anything repeating itself or being uh, uh, tedious to go through. And, uh, of course, it never did sell. That thing never did take off. Thank the Lord for that. But some people, they want things so quick, so easy, so smooth, so effortless on their part. How many of your, you know, my grandma, she used to cook baked potatoes in the oven. It would take over an hour for those things to heat up, wrapped in, you know, tin foil in the oven. Now we get impatient when it takes five minutes for a, a potato to cook in the microwave oven. That thing should be done in four minutes. That's how impatient we can be. So like I say, God's giving you a, a filet mignon. Don't sit there and expect him to cut it up for you and dice it up for you and puree it for you, put it in a blender so you can drink it down. 
Enjoy it. Enjoy it. So some people don't feed on God's word because they're too sick and because it's too tough, or so they think. Point number five, some men don't feed on the word of God because they themselves are too picky. They themselves are too picky. Don't you just love going to dinner with someone who's fussy and picky and, oh, the line's too long. We're never going to get in here. You know, you finally do get seated. Oh, can we get a, a, a booth rather than an open table? We'd rather have closed air. Oh, can we switch places? The air conditioner's on me now, you know. Oh, can we switch back? Now the sun's in my eyes. What do you mean you don't have it? I know you had it last time we ordered here. What do you mean you're all out tonight? I want to sell to shut up. <laughs> Sit down, shut up, enjoy the meal, and, uh, you know, <laughs> make the best of it. <laughs> Don't ruin everybody else's good time. Some people that way. They can't be happy no matter what they do. No matter where they go, no matter how someone caters to them and waits on them, somehow they're, they find a reason to be unhappy, to be miserable. I don't know why that is. And some people seem to approach the Word of God that way as well. They're too picky. Well, that's too difficult for me to understand. I don't understand those old English words. I don't understand the King James uh, vocabulary. I don't understand what he means by that particular sentence, or that turn of a phrase. I, get yourself a good Bible dictionary and learn what it means. You know one of the best tools for learning the Bible is a dictionary? You don't need Greek and Hebrew lexicons. You don't need reference books. You don't need a whole bookshelf of, of, of source material. What you need is a good dictionary and faith that God will teach it to you. Really. That'll clear up more misunderstanding than anything else. But people don't want to give God credit. They don't think God's smart enough to give them a book that can actually be easily discerned if they just be patient with it and be patient with Him. But they, they can be very fic, uh, finicky and they can be very picky. You know, TV preachers spend too much time emphasizing how to get wealthy, how to, God wants you rich, God wants you to prosper, God wants you to be successful, God wants you to be uh, uh, in perfect health. And uh, when you get all these things, send your money in to show God your gratitude, send it to our address, right? Yeah, that shows your gratitude to God, send it to some jerk's address. But, uh, yeah, I call them a jerk. And I mean, I mean specifically Kenneth Copeland, uh, Jesse Duplantis, uh, T.D. Jakes, most of the TBN preachers, Joel Osteen. These guys are all jackasses. They're all jackasses, and you're a fool if you listen to any single one of them. And you're a bigger fool if you give them a dime. Some people are finicky eaters. I only want to hear positive things from Pastor Joel. That's all you're going to hear because you're certainly not going to hear any Bible from him. You're not going to hear the word of God from him. You're only going to hear positive things. So, you know, don't be down and discouraged, friends. And God wants you to be positive and God wants you to do the shut up. You got 40,000 people there hanging on every lame word that guy utters. Hold up your Bible, pretend like you mean it. This is my Bible. Today I'm going to be. They never open it. They never crack it open. They never, he never shows them verse to verse. He never compares scripture to scripture. He wouldn't know one end of the Bible from the. He'd have it upside down before he'd figure out, you know, he's got it wrong, wrong way. You know, one of the most brilliant geniuses that was ever on Christian television is probably Jan Crouch. She was the standard for, uh, you know, <laughs> spirituality and among charismatics. When she was the standard, God helped Christianity. Paul and Jan Crouch had a couple of clowns, bigger clowns, never lived uh, in the 20th century than those two people. Some people are too uh, picky. They're too finicky. They want things nice. They want things to make them feel good. They want things to, to salve, uh, pacify their, uh, their feelings and uh, salve over their conscience and make them feel like they're doing right and they're living right and... All the good things are going to come to them. And they don't need to know the Word of God. They don't need to memorize any scripture. They don't need to learn the, learn the Word of God. They don't need to learn the Bible. Uh, why is the Bible here? Why is the Bible here if you don't need to learn it? You don't need to know it. You're never going to be held accountable for it. You don't need to memorize it. don't need to be acquainted with it. don't need to be familiar with it. 
Why is the Bible here then? Somebody's going to have to give an answer for it. Right. Somebody's going to have to answer to Jesus Christ for that book they had access to and ignored day after day and year after year. And I don't want that to be me. So it behooves me, it behooves you to spend time in it every day. Pray that God opens your uh, mind and opens revelation to you as you read. We have some, I've, we've met, I, we rather, I should say, we have uh, several sisters among our church members. I don't know why it's the ladies more than the men, but they ask some great questions, very thought provoking questions. And it keeps me on my toes. I have to say, well, let me read over that. Let me give you an answer for that. I, I've thought about it, but I've never really answered it before. And it keeps me on my toes, as I say. And I appreciate anyone who's really reading the Bible, paying attention. Something jumps out at them and they have a question about, they want some clarification about, because it deepens their understanding. That's a great blessing to me. It really is. You don't know how much a blessing that is. Let me, let me move on. The point, the last point today, point number six. Some men don't feed on the Word of God because they don't trust the cook. They don't trust the cook. Years ago, we had a lot more uh, potlucks at the church here. And, uh, you know, people bring stuff from home. They make it at home. It's all, but we have, uh, we have lunch together every Sunday, and all of our Korean sisters seem to all be very, very talented cooks. I don't know the names of half the dishes I'm eating, but uh, that's fine. It tastes great. And uh, I haven't gotten sick from any of it yet, so you know, thank the Lord for that too. But years ago, we had uh, potlucks, and there was one or two ladies here at the church, and I would make a point not to eat whatever they brought, because I didn't trust their sanitation. I didn't trust, I didn't trust however they made it. If something about them, I just I'm not going to eat that. I'm going to steer clear of the table uh, when it comes time to eat. And uh, so it is, uh, in a, a spiritual sense, some people don't want to read the Bible because they don't know God. They don't know Jesus Christ. They've never been born again. They've never trusted him to be their savior. So they don't know the Lord Jesus in a personal way as someone who can forgive their sins, who can regenerate their dead spirit, who guarantees their entrance into heaven when they die and uh, has their name in the Lamb's Book of Life and their eternity is secure. They don't know him in that way. And so they think there must be something about religion. There must be something about God. There's something sneaky. Why do they want me to do this? Why do they want me to go to there? Why do they want me to read the Bible? Why do they want me to do these things? It's good for you, you dumb jerk. You need it. But the Bible is the word of God. And your heart and your mind and your thoughts and your conscience are set in such a way to receive the word of God if you'd give him a chance. God wants to speak to every man. He wants to speak to every woman. And he wants to speak to them by his book. That's why the Bible's here. One of these days, you and I will have to stand before him and give a, an account of what we've known, what we've learned from it. Will we stand before him at the judgment seat of Christ, uh, completely ignorant of the scripture? Or will we have made some effort to know his book, to know him uh, intimately through his book? But some people don't trust the cook. They don't trust God. They think there must be something sneaky, something um, suspicious about God, about the whole idea of Jesus Christ. There really isn't. There always those, be those people that say, well, the Bible is just a book. It's just a superstitious book. And uh, there are all kinds of contradictions in it. You can't trust it. And um, you can't take any of it literally. Here's the problem with taking the scripture literally versus taking it figuratively. If the Bible is simply to be taken figuratively, where that means that anybody's interpretation is just as valid as anybody else's interpretation. There's really no absolute way to be, uh, to interpret it. 
But when you approach the Bible and say, I'm going to believe that what I'm reading is to be taken literally, it might have applied to someone in the past, it might not apply to me now, it might apply to someone in the future, but it's going to be literal no matter what. Then the definition, the, the interpretation is fixed. There's not a lot of wiggle room. And you have to either stand by the word of God or fall by it. Now, I would rather stand by the book and, and, and trust God to vindicate it and to defend it and to prove it to be true than to say, well, it's just sort of open-ended and you can, it kind of means whatever you want it to mean and it means what that person wants it to mean and what she wants it to mean. Everybody's interpretation is just as good as anybody else's. There's absolutely no hard and fast, fixed, absolute way to interpret the Bible. A lot of people want to approach God that way because they don't trust the cook. They don't trust that what they're reading on the page actually means what it says. And so, you go to some of these big mega churches, they're not interested in the Bible. They're interested in rock music. They're interested in their uh, Starbucks knockoff latte bar on the premises. They're interested in any number of things. Let's put a big screen uh, up so the men will at least leave the house and come and watch the Super Bowl game at church rather than doing it at home uh, once a year. Who know you? You'd be surprised all the things that are done supposedly in the name of the local church that have nothing to do with the Word of God, nothing to do with the Word of God, the Scripture, nothing to do with the ministry of the local church or reaching lost souls. But, and they have a multitude of versions. Go to the average Calvary Chapel in this area that's got a, a big size bookstore on their premises. You'll find six, seven, eight different translations for sale in their supposed Christian bookstore. You know what that means? That means they don't believe that any single one of those is the perfect word of God. They don't, they're not committed to any single one of those because you can have six, seven different, eight versions uh, people choose among themselves and who's to say this one's right and this one, that one's wrong? You know, you say tomato, I say tomato. But they can't all be right. They might all be wrong, but they can't all be right. In Luke chapter 2, verse 33, Joseph and Mary brought the Lord Jesus to the temple to be dedicated, and Simeon said some great things about the baby Christ. And Luke 2, 33, the Bible says, Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. All of the modern Bibles say his father and mother marveled at those things. By that subtle little change, they called Joseph Christ's father. That undermines the virgin birth. That undermines the deity of Jesus Christ. Hey, Roman Catholicism made a whole religion about Mary's virginity, right? They know that uh, Joseph wasn't Christ's father. How come modern Bible translators are too stupid to figure that out? One subtle change can change the entire doctrine of the Word of God. That's why we trust the cook. We trust the, the meal that he's prepared. We trust the Bible he's put in our hands to be exactly as he wants us to, to eat it and to enjoy it and to receive something from God through it. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. The only way the Word of God can work effectually in the life of any man or woman is for that man or woman to receive what he's reading as the Word of God. If he receives it simply as good advice, it doesn't work. It won't have the fruit and bear the fruit in his understanding that God wants it to bear. You need to enjoy every bite. That's why we talk about comparing Scripture with Scripture, verse by verse, comparing uh, one verse with another verse and another verse, and letting the Scriptures um, interpret the scriptures, letting the Bible interpret itself as we go. As I said earlier, it's not our job to change the Bible. The Bible's job is to change us. And that cannot be done if you approach the Bible and don't believe it's perfect to start with. We believe it's perfect to start with. And with that in mind, let's bring this to a conclusion and thank God for the word of God he's given to us. Feed on the word of God and, not, and, and don't shy away from it. Learn to love it more with the every passing day, and it'll be a blessing to you. 
uh, and the days to come.